second alongside my co-host, uh, Josh here from Hayes Presidential Site, uh, we decided to come up with sort of like an all collaborative program between NPS sites and um, nonprofit sites as well. So we came up with the all of the Ohio First Ladies, First Ladies of the Buckeye State. So we're going to have a few presentations tonight. They're going to be about 15 minutes each. Um, if you guys would please hold off all your comments until the very end, we'll have a Q&A session at the very end. So if you guys want to type in your questions as you're thinking of them in the chat, we will go back to that at the very end. I also will ask you guys to please mute your microphone so that we don't interrupt the presenters. I can also go through and <coughs> if you don't know how to do that as well. Um, but other than that, thank you guys so much for coming out. We do have a second part to this uh, next Thursday as well at the same time. So if you like what you see here, I recommend that you come back. But other than that, I'm going to go ahead and give it over to Josh. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much, Tara. Uh, my name is Josh Dubert. Again, I'm the uh, historian here at the Rutherford B. Hayes Presidential Library and Museums in Fremont, Ohio. Uh, I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to co-host this program uh, on the Ohio First Ladies. And uh, thank you so much to all the attendees for, for joining on. Looks like we got a good crowd today and we got some great programs. Uh, before we get going, I just want to thank uh, our sponsors here, uh, KF Construction and Excavating, uh, with additional funding provided by Al Albrechta and Cobble Limited. Uh, so Ohio claims eight presidents, um, William Henry Harrison, Ulysses S. Grant, Rutherford B. Hayes, James A. Garfield, uh, Benjamin Harrison, William McKinley, William Howard Taft, and uh, Warren G. Harding. So all these men, except for uh, uh, William Henry Harrison, were born in Ohio and six of the eight first ladies. Uh, now we're going to go in chronological order uh, for these sessions. So the first up is Anna Harrison, who will be discussed by <coughs> Thompson. Uh, John H.C. Thompson is the manager of historic programming and the head of interpretation at Fort Meg's historic site. He also leads their historic music department and uh, as a living historian serves as the drum major for the U.S. Forces 1812. Uh, Mr. Thompson is the writer and producer of the history podcast, The Foot of the Rapids, which earned the Ohio Academy of History's grand prize in 2021. Uh, John is a writer and researcher for Marine History Lines and sits on the board of directors for the Lake Erie Historical Society. Uh, lecturing throughout North America on the War of 1812, he's delighted to address the life of uh, Anna Harrison this evening, and we are thrilled to have him here. So, uh, John, take it away, sir. Well, thank you very much. We're delighted to talk about mm -hmm. amazing long life, and there's really four uh, major chapters I want to cover, and 15 minutes is a, is a quick little slot, so we're going to launch right into it. I really don't have uh, that much imagery to share with you guys. Uh, so I didn't really create a PowerPoint, but I'm just going to show you a couple of things um, on uh, just uh, Windows Viewer here. Uh, this is the uh, only a from life portrait of Anna Harrison, and it was used uh, in the promotion of this program. Uh, it's from Grouseland, but um, it's the only uh, first lady that appears uh, in, in oil here. But I think there's a lot that we can gather from this image. Uh, about her life, and I think it's a wonderfully expressive painting. Uh, when I first encountered this painting, what struck me was, was uh, how covered uh, Anna is. Uh, of course, we have to adhere to the, uh, the, the norms of ladies' fashion for the early 19th century, uh, but the black shawl coming up uh, beyond her jaw and uh, the, uh, the headpiece coming down, overlapping that, uh, just sealing her in and really covering her well. It struck me as rather nun-like in appearance, uh, if I can say that. Um, but indeed, Anna Harrison was an extremely religious person. Uh, she was uh, very involved in the Presbyterian church and uh, played hostess uh, for her church uh, in her home here in Ohio uh, every week, uh, especially towards the end of her life. And uh, with the modest widow's pension that she got from the national government, uh, she gave a lot of that money to the Presbyterian Church. So she was uh, very, very involved, this old, hard-line, Scotch uh, Presbyterian Church. Um, and the other thing that strikes me about this painting is uh, just its sort of somberness, uh, its dour uh, appearance. There's zero fixtures in the background, no furniture, <clears throat> this sort of absinthe drab uh, wallpaper. There's a there's a tragedy and a heaviness to this painting. And indeed, uh, Anna Harrison did have a bit of a tragic life, uh, surrounded by death all the time. 
not just the uh, famous death of her husband, uh, but uh, she will uh, live very long and outlive nine of her 10 children. And it's an extremely difficult thing for a parent to, to put a child uh, into the earth, but she will do this again and again and again. Uh, her husband dying in 1841, famously the first president to die in office, uh, this death comes in the midst of a slew of five or six family deaths. And William Henry Harrison is actually right in the middle. Uh, family deaths from the mid-1830s to the mid-1840s. So a, a very, very a heavy life uh, for her to live. Um, but uh, hopefully her religious fervor uh, helped her through those moments um, uh, out on the frontier. She didn't have... Uh, a terribly bizarre childhood, but I think it's one that prepared her for life on the frontier and uh, gave her a bit of an adventuresome spirit. Uh, she will be born in 1775, and her mother will die the following year in 1776. Her father, uh, John Cleve Sims, will try to raise her, uh, but difficult to do while there's a war on. Uh, the American Revolution is raging, and John Cleve Sims will be uh, heavily involved in that war as an officer in the New Jersey uh, colonial forces. So Anna will be largely raised by her grandparents, uh, her maternal grandparents, out on Long Island. And that's going to be in British-held territory uh, during the war. Uh, so she's going to be very isolated, never knowing her mother, barely knowing her father, uh, again, raised by her grandparents, who will send her off to boarding school uh, at the age of 15 in New York. Uh, so uh, sent away, she will be the first first lady to receive such a, a formal education at boarding school. But it's this idea that she's not particularly anchored anywhere, belonging nowhere, that I think is going to prepare her uh, to thrust herself out into the American. Are you, are you interested here. in this answer? Um, she will uh, go out onto the frontier in the 1790s, uh, joining uh, her father and her new stepmother uh, out in uh, the Ohio country. Her father, John Cleve Sims, a uh, very famous name in Ohio history, the Sims Purchase, of course, is a massive tract of land that her father purchases, which makes up basically three modern day counties in uh, southwest Ohio. She comes out uh, in the 1790s where she will meet a young uh, Army officer, Lieutenant William Henry Harrison. Yep. Uh, her father did not approve of the match uh, to a soldier, uh, but I think it was a good match. Uh, Harrison is a rising star in the West. He has already uh, served at the Battle of Fallen Timbers in 1794 as an aide-de-camp, and he has been a signer of the Treaty of Greenville, 1795. The Treaty of Greenville very much a foundational document for the, mon uh, the modern state of Ohio. Uh, he will be very uh, involved in those negotiations and signing the treaty. Um, her father not approving of the marriage, they did not exactly elope, uh, but they did take advantage of the fact that her father was out of town on business uh, in order to get married at the home of a family friend. And William Henry Harrison uh, didn't even obtain a furlough from the army in order to get married. So they had to celebrate their honeymoon at Fort Washington uh, because Harrison was uh, was still on duty. <clears throat> uh, but we don't really know when her father accepted William Henry Harrison as a, a member of the family. A lot of sources kind of glance over this period and say, oh, well, he saw how much uh, she loved William Henry and he brought he brought him into the family. I'm not so sure that's true. And as a, a military historian, uh, we look at uh, this moment uh, on your screen as uh, William Henry being accepted uh, into the Sims family when her father gives him uh, his Revolutionary War sword as a family memento, as now a family heirloom. Uh, this is the famous Jacob Heard sword that uh, John Cleve Sims carried in the Revolution. He will have his name inscribed on it and will give it to William Henry Harrison only after he has proven himself in battle, it said. And I don't know how you top Fallen Timbers in 1794, but it's uh, believed then that he does not receive this until uh, the aftermath of the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811. So Anna and William are already uh, making a life together and bearing children for a decade, uh, really before John Cleve Sims accepts him in. 
But this is a beautiful sword. It's a beautiful uh, artifact. And this is the sword that William Henry Harrison is wearing at his famous inauguration uh, in, in 1841. So a uh, remarkable piece. Uh, uh, we can talk about that later uh, sometime. So uh, uh, William Henry Harrison, though, uh, will not remain in the Army very long. Uh, he joins politics, and in 1800, uh, he's nominated as the territorial governor of Indiana. So he and Anna move out to Vincennes, the famous house they build at Grouseland there in the Indiana Territory. And this is really uh, where the family takes root, and uh, uh, they make a go of it. Um, they must have loved each other because they will bear uh, 10 children together. And as an educated woman, uh, Anna will be largely uh, responsible for looking after the education and the development of her children. So she's very much a model for uh, this new American that's moving out west, uh, not some aristocrat uh, out on the East Coast. No, she's going to hack a life out in a two-story brick home uh, bearing 10 children along the way. Uh, so it's a bit of a remarkable story. I do want to talk very briefly about her children because uh, many of the sources that you see uh, have incorrect dates, particularly for uh, her youngest two children, Anna Tuthill Harrison and James um, uh, James Finley Harrison. A lot of sources you read, uh, the White House websites, um, First Lady, they uh, list um, the ninth child as being born in 1813. And we at Fort Meigs were struck by this. How is this possible to be born in October of 1813? There was no chance for uh, this child to be conceived uh, because uh, her husband was uh, uh, persecuting the war right here at Fort Meigs at the time. So we really started digging in and tracking their movements. And uh, indeed, uh, Anna Tudhill Harrison is not born until November of uh, 1814. Uh, and their youngest child is often listed as being born in 1814, actually is not born until 1818, when Anna is uh, 43 years old and still bearing children. Um, their last son, James, will die in infancy at nine months, and uh, William and Anna will bury him and create the headstone that clearly reads 1818. So we really need to start looking at um, uh, the age ranges and the life of their children a little bit differently and correct uh, some of the some of the literature that's out there. Uh, while we are talking about death, though, we should mention uh, the president. Um, uh, William Henry Harrison will die in office. Uh, Anna did not want him to be president, was not pleased that he had been elected, uh, and she never gets to Washington. Uh, when William Henry Harrison leaves uh, for the Capitol in the winter of 1840, becoming 1841, uh, Anna is ill and unable to make the trip in winter. Uh, so William Henry will take his widowed uh, daughter-in-law, Jane Irwin, to act as uh, his female counterpart uh, at the Capitol. And it was, you know, supposed that Anna would join uh, them uh, in the spring of the year when she felt better. And sort of famously, she had the whole house packed up and was ready to move uh, when the courier arrived to announce that the president uh, had indeed died. And again, in a slew of family deaths that uh, she will have to endure. Uh, the death of William Henry Harrison is kind of a schoolyard story, you know, about a man that uh, gave a very long speech uh, outdoors without a coat and without a hat on. And he contracts pneumonia from this and will die uh, within 30 days. But uh, the, the research is getting is getting on now. Uh, there's a tremendous amount done on his death in uh, 2014. And uh, that research really concluded that it wasn't pneumonia that killed him. Pneumonia was in his body when he died, yes, but it's believed that what actually killed him uh, was uh, an infection that uh, he got from, from the water in Washington, D.C., in the White House water. There were night soil deposits around uh, Washington, D.C., and one particularly close to the White House uh, that made him very, very ill. William Henry Harrison uh, suffered his whole life from dyspepsia, uh, an extreme uh, indigestion uh, that he was treated for his whole life, including while he was here uh, at Fort Meigs. And it's thought that this treatment for uh, dyspepsia actually uh, killed and annihilated all of the good bacteria in his stomach that he needed to fight off bad uh, infections. Uh, and so uh, a healthy person would have uh, been able to uh, take on uh, this bad water in Washington, D.C., but not an older gentleman without uh, the proper uh, tools in his stomach to fight it off. But uh, this was a time when the water in Washington 
was particularly bad. Uh, I know John Tyler also got very, very sick. And of course, uh, Zachary Taylor, uh, who dies in office as well. Um, so we really need to start uh, rethinking the narrative and how we describe Harrison's death. Uh, but uh, Anna will receive uh, a pension, a widow's pension from the national government. Uh, she got $25,000 in a lump sum uh, to, uh, to last for the rest of her life. And she got free use of the post office as well, which she took very, very good advantage of uh, uh, writing letters her whole life uh, vigorously. And she actually helped out a lot of early historians as well that were working on the War of 1812 uh, and the president's life. Uh, so she communicated with them uh, uh, greatly and, uh, and helped them out and actually gave away his signature uh, from his papers, famously. But uh, she is a very long-lived woman. She lived to be 88 years of age. And uh, as I said, she outlived uh, nine of her 10 children. Uh, their big home in North Bend, Ohio, will burn in uh, 1858, and she will spend uh, the last years of her life uh, living with her uh, last surviving son, John Scott. And she dies uh, during the American Civil War uh, in 1864, uh, Anna Harrison. Uh, a wonderful life, uh, a good um, frontier example of a new American. Uh, someone that uh, endured a lot in her life, yet uh, persevered, it seems. Um, if you do have questions, uh, by all means, uh, send them to me here at Fort Meggs. I love to share, uh, but thank you very much. That was Anna Harrison. Wonderful, John. Thank you so much for that. Uh, in interesting to hear about the new theories about William Henry Harrison's death. Uh, that's That'll be interesting to read more about. Well, I'm up next, and I'm going to be uh, speaking about uh, Lucy Hayes. No surprise there. And I'm just going to share my screen here. It'll just be a moment. Oh, great. Well, Lucy Ware Webb Hayes, uh, she lived just 57 years, uh, but they're years full of learning, uh, hardship, tragedy, love, adventure, uh, and remarkable achievement. Her lifetime roughly spanned the uh, American Victorian period, a, a time of immense change and uh, also a harrowing civil war. Uh, yet through all of her personal and public trials, uh, Lucy maintained her bearing, her poise, uh, her geniality, serving as her husband's confidant in war and politics, uh, as a nurse to Union soldiers, uh, as a mother to an ever-growing family, as a First Lady of the United States, and uh, as champion of a number of causes, including temperance, veterans affairs, children's welfare, uh, poor relief, and education for African Americans. Uh, Lucy was born in Chillicothe, Ohio on August 28, 1831 to Maria Cook Webb and James Webb. Uh, like Rutherford, whose father died before he was born, uh, Lucy did not know her father. Uh, James Webb, a physician in the War of 1812, died in a cholera epidemic in Kentucky in 1833 when Lucy was only two years old. Uh, she took classes at Ohio Wesleyan uh, in 1840, in the 1840s while her brothers uh, were there studying medicine. Uh, on an 1845 term report, the school's vice president noted that Lucy's conduct was, quote, unexceptionable, uh, which translated to beyond repro reproach. Basically, that means she was a great student. She would later go on to attend uh, Cincinnati Wesleyan Female College, uh, where she would earn a liberal arts degree. Uh, graduating in June of 1850, uh, Lucy is actually the first first lady to hold a college degree. Uh, Lucy first met Rutherford at the Sulphur Springs in Delaware, Ohio in 1845. Uh, Rutherford wrote that she was a, quote, bright, sunny-hearted girl who was too young to fall in love with, so I didn't, unquote. Uh, in 1849, however, Rutherford moved to Cincinnati uh, from Lower Sandusky, today Fremont, Ohio, where we are here at the museum, to practice law and began uh, visiting Lucy at school. 
1851, he wrote in his diary, uh, I guess I am a great deal in love with Lucy, her low, sweet voice, her soft, rich eyes. Uh, he was also uh, enamored not only of her physical characteristics, but her personality and acumen. So he wrote later that intellect she has too, a quick, sprightly one. Now, Lucy and Rutherford were engaged in June of uh, 1851 and married a year and a half later on December 30th, 1852 in Cincinnati. Uh, they set up house in the city and Lucy gave birth to her first child there uh, in November of 1830, uh, 1853. Uh, his name's Burchard. Uh, after the wedding, uh, the couple visited Rutherford's sister, Fanny, in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Lucy spent a good deal of time with Fanny uh, who was a supporter of women rights, women's rights. Uh, the two women often discussed the subject, and perhaps had she lived longer, uh, Fanny, who died in 1856 from complications uh, related to childbirth, uh, would have further influenced Lucy in this regard. Fortunately, we'll never know. But in 1854, Lucy wrote that, uh, quote, it is acknowledged by most persons that a woman's mind is as strong as a man's. Instead of being considered the slave of man, she is considered his equal in all things and his superior in some, end quote. Uh, it is notable, however, that she, like her husband, did not support women's suffrage. Uh, this was typical during an age that's sub subscribed to a set of social rules that call the uh, cult of domesticity or the cult of true womanhood, uh, in which women were expected to be the angel of the law. Uh, sort of the god of the domestic sphere, raising children and caring for the household and tending to domestic tasks while the husband ventured out into public, earned money, and uh, represented the citizenship of the vote for the family. Lucy and Rutherford had uh, eight children together, though only five survived into adulthood. Now, among the surviving children were uh, Burchard, who followed his father into law, uh, Webb Cook, a military man and the founder of the uh, Hayes Presidential Library in 1916, the first presidential library in the country. Uh, we have Rutherford Platt, uh, Scott, uh, and we also have a daughter, Fanny, uh, named after Rutherford's sister, Fanny Arabella Hayes Platt. Uh, three sons, uh, Joseph, George, and Manning, they all did not survive their second summer, unfortunately. Lucy's fondness for politics was revealed in her support for John C. Fremont uh, for president in 1856. Uh, Lucy was an admirer of Fremont and his wife, Jesse Benton. Uh, she took uh, his as well as Jesse's loss to James Buchanan uh, very hard. Uh, Lucy influenced her husband's views on slavery as well. Uh, Rutherford, early an anti-abolitionist like many white Americans at the time, would go on to defend runaway slaves. So these freedom-seeking people trying to escape slavery and uh, cross over uh, the river into free Ohio while he was a lawyer in Cincinnati in the 1850s. Now, Lucy held firm anti-slavery views and was a proponent of education for African Americans. Uh, she actually taught one of the Hayes' free black servants, uh, Eliza Jane, how to read and write, and she played a central part in uh, Mary Monroe, the daughter uh, of the Hayes' longtime African American servant, Winnie Monroe, attending Oberlin College here in Ohio. Now, both Lucy and Rutherford would come to understand that the Civil War was being fought over slavery. Now, Lucy was a supporter of the war from the moment she heard about the firing on Fort Sumner in, on uh, April 12, 1861. And she urged Rutherford, who was then 38 years old, to join the cause. Uh, so while Rutherford was a soldier in the Ohio 23rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry, uh, Lucy visited him where the regiment was camped uh, along the Kanawha River in West Virginia. And she spent over 200 days in the camps with uh, Rutherford and the troops, uh, often with her children and even with her mother. Uh, Lucy's three children who died before they were uh, two have some connections with the war. So Joseph, the first son, he died of dysentery uh, in 1863 while he's at Camp White. And according to Lucy Keeler, uh, one of Rutherford's cousins, uh, Lucy said that the bitterest moment of her life was watching his little coffin uh, go across the river on the barge to be buried in Cincinnati. Uh, George Crook died of scarlet fever in 1866, and Manning Force, the youngest Hayes child, uh, died in 1874 of summer complaint, which is most likely uh, dysentery. Uh, the last two children were named after uh, Civil War officers that Rutherford greatly admired. 
During the course of the Civil War, uh, Lucy spent time in the camp caring for the sick and injured as well, and she would repair the soldiers' clothing. Uh, they really loved her, and they thought of her as the mother of the regiment, and they later celebrated her at the White House in 1877 by giving her the silver plaque that we have hanging in the Hayes House today that has a little poem inscribed for her and a uh, uh, little picture uh, engraving of the cabin she was living in, too. Uh, after the war, while her husband was serving uh, as governor of Ohio in the 1870s, uh, Lucy secured funding for an orphanage for the children of Civil War veterans. So that's the first president's wife to officially be called first lady in the papers. So Mary Clemmer Ames, a well-known uh, reporter at the time, uh, noted how modest this was in appearance and manner, but could not help wondering whether Washington society and the pressures of her duties would, quote, uh, frizz her hair, powder her face, bare her shoulders, shorten her sleeves, hide John Wesley's discipline out of sight as it poses and minces before the first lady of the land, end quote. So a lot of these stylistic things that you're seeing uh, during this time, the late Victorian period. Uh, but Lucy did not change. Uh, other newspapers and the journalists as well at the time, uh, as well as other social leaders, uh, took up the title. And so they begin to refer to Lucy as a first lady. And of course, the term sticks. Many of you have probably heard uh, Lucy referred to by another nickname, Lemonade Lucy, uh, ostensibly because she banned liquor in the White House. This was actually Rutherford's decision, uh, though Lucy was, of course, pleased with it, to be sure. Uh, the decision was partly for moral reasons uh, and partly pro political. So Rutherford really believed that public officials should maintain a dignified demeanor. Uh, in public, but also he wanted to keep the support of the temperance wing of the Republican Party. So uh, again, serving those two functions. Uh, the nickname was most likely given to Lucy by wets or uh, pro drinkers uh, not interested in the temperance movement. Uh, she was probably called this in private circles at the time, but the name doesn't actually uh, enter textbooks until the 20th century. Uh, during her time in the White House, she was approached by women's rights groups and activists who urged her to utilize her station uh, to, as a means of promoting the vote and equal rights for women. Uh, but Lucy remained noncommittal on uh, the issue, preferring the more traditional role of raising her two young children and uh, acting as confident advisor to her three uh, older boys. Though she was a lifelong abstainer from alcohol, uh, she did not commit to organizations such as the Women's Christian Temperance Union, despite its continual pressure on her to do so. Uh, however, the WTCU did commission and pay for a portrait of Lucy known as the Huntington Portrait, seen here, uh, painted by Daniel Huntington in 1880. When the children of uh, Washington, D.C. were banned from rolling their Easter eggs on the uh, grounds of the Capitol, uh, Lucy decided to host them on the White House lawn. And so she started a tradition which continues today. And it even continues uh, here at the Hayes. We have a, a yearly Easter egg uh, rolling. In December of 1877, Rutherford and Lucy celebrated their silver wedding anniversary by renewing their vows in the White House uh, by the same priest who conducted their original ceremony uh, with Lucy wearing her original wedding dress, though uh, she did have to have the seams let out a bit after having eight children, she had gained a little bit of weight. And then there was a second uh, dress that was commissioned for the second day uh, party, and uh, that is actually in the Smithsonian today. The China the Hayes Commission for their term in the White House was unique, uh, representing flora and fauna of the people um, and the uh, First Nations of the Americas, uh, as painted by Theodore Davis. Uh, but they were not popular with Washington society. And you can see here uh, a quote, and I'm hoping this uh, screen isn't in the way here. You'll be able to see uh, about uh, one Washington reporter's complaint. Another Washington com uh, reporter uh, or I'm sorry, Congressman, um, a, uh, a member of the House. He was at the House, at the White House, having a dinner, and he was eating soup out of a bowl. And when he got to the bottom of the bowl, he saw this wolf snarling at him, and apparently that startled him. That was just unacceptable. Uh, during the entirety of her four years as First Lady, uh, Lucy was known as a gracious host, and uh, by the end of her husband's term, was deemed by one paper the most widely known and popular president's wife the country had ever known. Let's see. 
over here. Uh, Lucy spent her last eight years in Fremont enjoying the grounds at Spiegel Grove and especially the animals uh, which she pampered. Uh, she loved to spend time feeding pigeons and the dove coat and uh, also the family dogs. Uh, once Rutherford teased her about uh, what kind of carpet she wanted to put in the horse stalls, whether it was going to be Brussels or because they uh, so spoiled uh, the animals here. She also served as the national president of the uh, Women's Home Missionary Society, uh, an organization newly formed by the Methodist Church from 1880 until her death in 1889, and also worked with the Women's Relief Corps, uh, which sought to assist uh, Civil War veterans uh, preserve their memory and provide uh, aid to their families. In early June of 1889, uh, Lucy suffered a mild stroke during a church service. Uh, it startled her enough to instruct Ruther for her to instruct Rutherford on uh, what she wanted for her funeral service. Uh, later on, on June 22nd, 1889, uh, Lucy and a servant named Ella Graves were uh, sitting side by side in the Hayes bedroom and they were sewing. And at one point, uh, Ella looked over and noticed that Lucy was uh, sort of staring at her needle fixedly. Uh, she wasn't able to thread her needle and she also wasn't responding to Ella when she uh, was calling out to her. And uh, they realized that she was having uh, what was a considered an apoplectic stroke, so a major stroke. Uh, she was moved to her bed, uh, which is the bed in, in the Hayes bedroom still today, and her children and her uh, husband came to her side. Uh, she could not speak, so she had to communicate by you know, hand squeezing, etc. And she slowly slips away over three days, and on June 25th, uh, she dies and is buried in uh, Oakwood Cemetery in Fremont. Uh, later, her remains and Rutherfords are uh, exhumed and moved to the grounds at Spiegel Grove. Uh, one little side note, uh, Rutherford in his diary would write about Lucy that uh, 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 the newspapers in town would write about how, uh, what a beautiful house Spiegel Grove was, the Hayes home, and how it had a lot of beautiful things. But he would say that uh, now that Lucy's gone, I realize that the soul has gone out of the house. So he's kind of lost without her after she passes away. Uh, condolences poured in from around the nation. Uh, Lucy's biographer, Emily Apt-Gear, has accumulated some in, uh, in her biography, First Lady, The Life of Lucy Webb Hayes. Uh, the New York Tribune wrote that Lucy was a, quote, woman of rare intelligence and deep conviction. Her kindness and hospitality uh, will not soon be forgotten in the national capital, unquote. The Springfield Republican Times wrote that she was the, quote, most competent entertainer who ever occupied the executive mansion, end quote. Finally, the De Detroit Free Press stated that Lucy was, quote, a good woman with an abundant stock of old-fashioned virtues, end quote. Uh, Rutherford, for his part, would write that, uh, quote, the most interesting fact of his life, end quote, was his marriage to Lucy, uh, and that the crowning facility, uh, felicity of his life had been to dwell with Lucy, and that she spread happiness uh, all around her. All right. Well, our last presentation of the day uh, is going to be by uh, Mr. Todd Arrington, uh, another uh, park ranger. Uh, Todd Arrington is the site manager of James A. Garfield National Historic Site in Mentor, Ohio, uh, where he is responsible for all aspects of the National Park Service's operation of the site. Uh, a career National Park Service historian and park ranger for over 24 years, he has also worked at Homestead National Monument of America in Nebraska, and Gettysburg National Military Park and Eisenhower National Historic Site, both in Pennsylvania. He is a veteran of the United States Army and holds a PhD in history from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, writing formally as Benjamin T. Arrington, he has uh, been published several times on subjects related to the American Civil War, the early Republican Party, the Reconstruction Era, and America's westward expansion. Todd, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thanks, Josh. Hi, everybody. Uh, very nice to be on with you this evening. Uh, glad to be here and really appreciate uh, the Hayes Presidential Center and uh, my colleague, my National Park Service colleagues at First Ladies National Historic Site coming together to put this program together. So uh, I have 15 minutes to tell you all about the life of Lucretia Rudolph Garfield, uh, who was unfortunately very briefly the, pre the First Lady of the United States. Uh, you heard uh, about Anna Harrison a little bit ago, 
who unfortunately has the distinction of being the uh, shortest tenured first lady in American history. Uh, and you're now hearing about Lucretia Rudolph Garfield, who is the second shortest tenured first lady in American history. I'm going to try a screen share here. Uh, I just have a couple of images of Mrs. Garfield to put up. If for some reason the screen share doesn't work, uh, I just won't worry about it. So um, is anything showing up on the screen there, Josh? Uh, just looks like it's just about to. Yeah, and if you want to do the full-on view, you'd be all set. Uh, yes, if I could figure out how to do that, I would. It's, uh, the top, you see the on at the very top in the red. If you look over, there's a little play button in a stand at the very top red bar of the yeah the um the the zoom toolbar is is blocking me i can't see <laughs> i can't oh. see it so um oh well hopefully this this will this is visible to everyone at least um i'm afraid that if i try to block out of the move the <laughs> the zoom toolbar i'll end up clicking myself out of the 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 show, so I don't want to do that. So anyway, um, so Lucretia Rudolph Garfield was born April 19th, 1831. She was born in a little town called Garrettsville, Ohio. Um, about we're in Mentor, Ohio, which is near Cleveland. Uh, Garrettsville is maybe an hour or so south of us. Uh, if you know where Hiram is, it's very near Hiram, which is the site of Hiram College. Uh, and that is actually significant as well in that uh, the Hiram College was initially founded as the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute. Uh, so try to you know say that name real fast. Imagine trying to be a cheerleader for, for, for a school with a name that long. Uh, that school is now Hiram College. So if you know Hiram College, uh, that that place does have uh, deep meaning to the 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 memory of both James Garfield and Lucretia Garfield, uh, particularly Lucretia Garfield, because her father, whose name was Zeb Rudolph, was one of the founders of the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute. Uh, the school was founded by members of the Disciples of Christ denomination. That is the denomination that both Lucretia and James Garfield belong to for their entire lives. Uh, so they actually met Previously, uh, previous to both attending the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute at a school in Chesterland called the Geauga Seminary, which is no longer there, uh, and then both eventually went on to the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute, which everyone called the Eclectic, and so I will save minutes off of my presentation by just calling it the Eclectic from here on out. Uh, so they met, and they sort of reconnected at the Eclectic, uh, were very fond of one another, and uh, became, uh, started to, to court, you know, he started to court her, uh, and then he went off for a couple of years to Massachusetts to go to school. After finishing at the Eclectic, uh, he went up to Williams College, came back uh, after graduating from Williams uh, and became a teacher at the Eclectic. So started teaching at his alma mater and then um, eventually became the principal or the, what we would call today the president of that school. And so it was during this period that he and Lucretia then were finally able to, to be together again. Uh, and then they married in, uh, in 1858. And here's a, we call this their engagement photo. This is taken around the time they were engaged. We don't know if it's exact, uh, but obviously they both look uh, quite different than what you see. They're, they're much younger. I think the, the change in James Garfield here is far more pronounced because of course later uh, he has much less hair on his head as, as many of us do as we get older. Uh, and uh, he also has the big bushy beard that we're sort of used to seeing on him. Uh, so that is James Garfield uh, as a, as a young man in his twenties, and then a course, and then the photo there with Lucretia uh, Rudolph. So they married in 1858. Uh, they eventually had seven children, like many of the the first ladies that you've heard about tonight. Uh, they uh, not all of their children survived childhood. Uh, actually, the Garfields did fairly well in that regard. Of their seven children, two. Uh, died in childhood. So five of their children did, uh, you know, grow to adulthood, get married, have their own families. So by the time Mrs. Garfield died, uh, she had uh, 16 grandchildren. Uh, of course, if you know anything about James Garfield, you know, unfortunately, he didn't live long enough to uh, to to enjoy any of those grandchildren. Uh, and I'll go back to the first one here just to show you, you know, there's Mrs. Garfield's lifespan, April 19th, 1831 to March 13th, 1918. So we're coming up uh, next week sometime on the uh, anniversary of her death. And as I said, she's the shortest, second shortest tenured first lady. You can see she's only uh, 
First Lady of the United States, March 4th to September 19th of 1881. Uh, because, of course, James Garfield, after becoming president, uh, is only president for about four months before being uh, being shot on July 2nd, 1881. He doesn't die right away. Uh, he actually survives the shooting. He's very seriously injured, of course, but he does uh, survive the shooting. He's carried back to the White House uh, and um, is basically in the White House for almost the next two and a half months receiving medical treatment. And it's pretty widely accepted today. I really was appreciated what, what John was saying earlier about sort of the rethinking of the death of, of William Henry Harrison and, and the different uh, uh, the different theories on his death now that, you know, this old wives tale about, you know, he caught pneumonia at his uh, at his uh, inauguration is probably not quite the case. Um, in James Garfield's case, it was fairly well known shortly after his death, maybe not at the time of, but shortly thereafter, that really it was not, unfortunately, the, the bullet wounds that killed him. It was uh, the medical care that he received from his doctors. Uh, his doctors at this time were uh, were by and large um, you know, American, American, male American doctors who were, um, you know, in their 40s or 50s had been practicing medicine for a while and were not quite on board yet with what we would think of today as germ theory. So uh, in Europe, doctors primarily at that point ha had accepted germ theory to the most for the most part, not the case here in the United States. So doctors treating President Garfield uh, were using, you know, not washing their hands, not washing their instruments, and they eventually introduced infection into his body, and that's what killed him. Mrs. Garfield was uh, by his side almost the entire time. Uh, Mrs. Garfield, as first lady, had actually gotten very sick. Um, as again, as John mentioned earlier, the the water in Washington D.C. was was very troublesome for a very long time, and uh, the you know the heat and the humidity. There were always mosquitoes buzzing around in the summer, and so Mrs. Garfield got very sick uh, around May of 1881, uh, after she'd only been first lady for about two months. She got very sick with what we we think today probably was malaria or something close to that. Uh, so she was very sick for for uh, you know a good chunk of the time she was living in the White House as First Lady. Uh, by the time you know mid June or so rolled around, she was improving, uh, and she left the White House and went down to the seashore at um, Long Branch, New Jersey, which was kind of a, vac a, va a vacation hotspot at that time. Uh, and she went there for a couple of weeks. James Gar President Garfield did go with her for the first week or so and then had to go back to Washington. She remained in New Jersey. Uh, and in fact, on July 2nd, 1881, she was packing up to leave New Jersey. Uh, they were going to meet, she and the president were going to meet on the train and then they were gonna head on up to, uh, up to New England for a college reunion for him. And then they were going on vacation. Uh, they were gonna spend some time with some friends in New England and then eventually wind their way back to Menor, Ohio, uh, to uh, to the, the home that is that we now manage as James A. Garfield National Historic Site. Um, so she was packing up to leave. She received word he'd been shot. She immediately rushed back to the White House, and she was by his side for the next two and a half months. Uh, and, um, you know, she she made a, a comment at one point in, in one of her letters that, you know, he made a comment to her one time that she was she was the best nurse that he had had. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Mrs. Garfield had a physician whose name was Dr. Susan Edson, a, 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 a female doctor. Uh, Dr. Edson came to the White House to try to offer aid to, for, to President Garfield as well. And as you can imagine, uh, the male doctors kind of pushed her aside and really relegated her to, to nothing more than, than nursing duty. Dr. Edson was actually one of the American doctors at that time who who was aware of germ theory and was suggesting that perhaps the doctors should wash their hands or, or use clean instruments. And of course, we all know how that turned out. They did not do that. And then eventually that infection is what killed what killed uh, uh, President Garfield. So President Garfield uh, eventually returns to uh, the, the shore at Long uh, Long Branch, New Jersey, uh, in early September of 1881, after he's been 
in, in the White House for about eight weeks trying to recover. He and Mrs. Garfield, are they go back to New Jersey, and the doctors at this point know that he's in very bad shape, and they're hoping that the sea air will prove restorative to him, that it'll it'll bring him back, and that doesn't happen. Of course, he dies in New Jersey, uh, and then Mrs. Garfield, of course, goes back to uh, back to the White House. The funeral is held. Uh, uh, there's a funeral in, in Washington, and then an, uh, the, the, another funeral here in Cleveland. Uh, and then Mrs. Garfield begins at 49 years old, begins the sort of the second phase of her life, which is uh, being a, a, a widow, the widow uh, of, a, of a president of the United States. She goes on to live until 1918. So she outlives her husband by about 36 and a half years. Uh, she gets very interested in a lot of very interesting things for the uh, over the, the remainder of, of her life. Um, she followed a lot of during James Garfield's life. She followed a lot of the same uh, social sort of prescriptions on women's behavior that Josh mentioned for, with Mrs. Hayes. You know, she didn't express her political opinions. She didn't say anything publicly about whether he she felt women should have suffrage. Um, the Garfields were not. Um, uh, temperance advocates, but neither one of them drank very much anyway. So while you know they they kind of didn't keep the same uh, the same uh, uh, out rules about alcohol in the White House that that the Hayes's did, the Garfields themselves really didn't drink much anyway. But Mrs. Garfield never expressed a public opinion at all about temperance, anything like that. Um, but as she she got older, of course, her concern became primarily caring for her her family. She had five relatively young children when when she was widowed uh her children were from you know teenage years down to about four or five years old when president garfield died um fortunately there were a number of uh, very generous people in the in the country who uh started a what they called at the time a subscription fund for the garfield family uh that was basically like what we would think of today as like a a GoFundMe, that you know, Kickstarter, that kind of thing. Basically, a, a you know, a charitable organization people could donate money into that would eventually go to the Garfield family. Uh, Mrs. Garfield eventually received about three hundred and sixty thousand uh, dollars from that subscription fund in the eighteen eighties. Today, that would equate to somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to ten million dollars. So they did become a very wealthy family, but of course, the price of that was you know the the way that they became that was that President Garfield had to to die this really horrible, uh, painful and and long, slow death. Um, so Mrs. Garfield did at least, though, have money to live on for the rest of her life. Um, she eventually uh, started using the home here in Mentor as as kind of a summer home. Uh, later in life, she built a uh, a second home out in South Pasadena, California. Her daughter, Molly, the only the only girl of the five Garfield children that survived childhood, uh, her daughter Molly had gotten married and, and Molly's husband worked in Southern California. So Mrs. Garfield eventually built a, a home there in Southern California that, that it actually is still there now. It's privately owned, uh, but it is uh, the home is still there. Uh, and then Mrs. Garfield started kind of going, you know, spending the summers here in 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 Mentor, Ohio, right on Lake Erie, uh, and then spending the winters out in uh, in Southern California. And it was in Southern California that she uh, she died on March 13th, uh, 1918, just a just a month or so shy of her 86th birthday. So she did have a very uh, long life after President Garfield's death. Uh, she and the president were both 49 when he died, so very young. Uh, and then she went on to to be almost 86 years old. And here's a, a photo of her um, around 1900 or so. Um, but she, you know, looks older there, obviously, but but still um, uh, had 18 years to live once this this photo was taken. The photo on the right, which I realize is a little blurry, uh, is the Garfield Memorial in Lakeview Cemetery here in Cleveland. That is where um, the president and Mrs. Garfield are both. Uh, I think the probably the proper word is entombed, not interred, because they are actually not buried in the earth in the you can go uh, once this reopens it's it's closed now for renovations and, and cleaning but um, once that reopens you can actually go into the basement of that facility and the caskets are actually sitting there they're you can't walk up to them but they are not in the earth they are sitting on on pedestals in the um, in the basement of the uh, of that facility um, and so again, Mrs. Garfield had had 16 grandchildren by the time she died. Um, we are very fortunate to still have many, many Garfields still around in the Cleveland area. We see Garfields, I mean, really all the time. I mean, it's nothing for Garfields to show up at our special events. They're involved with some of our nonprofit partners that we work with. So we're very fortunate to still have uh, many Garfield descendants out there. 
uh, and a lot of them local to us in the Cleveland area. So um, we are uh, very pleased that the Garfields are involved and, and are uh, happy with the job that the National Park Service is doing. Uh, the final photo I'll show here, this is the home that we uh, that we take people through at James A. Garfield National Historic Site. This is the home from which James Garfield ran for president in, in 1880, ran the nation's first uh, front porch presidential campaign from this home. And you can't really see it on the, in this photo, but uh, on the back of the house, there's a large addition to the home that Mrs. Garfield had built with some of that uh, um, subscription fund money. She built a memorial library onto the back of the house, and that memorial library contains all of the books that she and James Garfield owned. Uh, we have about 2,000 books in the home, and most of them are in that room. Uh, there's also a small, what we call a vault now. She called it the memory room, uh, and that actually is a, is a small, basically like a, it is like a small vault uh, in the back part of the library where she preserved all of his papers, letters, diaries, these types of things. So she created an archive of his public career. Uh, this library was only for the family. It was not open to the public. So what we say, because we know our, our friends at Hayes have the first sort of modern presidential library where that was built for historians to be able to come in and do research in, in, in original records. What we say at James A. Garfield National Historic Site is that Mrs. Garfield kind of created the idea for presidential libraries with this memorial library, which again was only open for the family. It was not open to the public, but still uh, a very historic piece of, of property here when you consider the first front porch presidential campaign and the, the birthplace of the presidential library idea. So uh, especially that that memorial library is, is it's a beautiful room. It's everybody's favorite room in the house. And uh, it obviously shows that Mrs. Garfield had a lot of foresight and uh, wanted to make sure that that the memory of her husband was preserved for for her family and then later for the entire country. So uh, with that, I'll stop my screen share and uh, I will stop my presentation. Thank you all very much for your time and attention. And I, like everybody, I'll hang around and see if there are any questions. Back to you, Josh. Thanks very much. All right. Todd, thank you very much. A fascinating. I, a quick question for you. Is the house in New Jersey where um, President Garfield died still standing? No, unfortunately, it's not. That was a, a property known as Franklin Cottage. And interestingly enough, as I said, Long Branch, New Jersey was a kind of a hotspot vacation uh, place at that time. Uh, believe it or not, of all people, um, the, the, the grant family uh, that, that Ashton talked about uh, had a, a property there. I believe it was actually owned by one of their sons. And um, when James Garfield went to New Jersey with Mrs. Garfield shortly before he was shot, um, President, former President Grant was there. And of course, there's all this kind of tension between Garfield and Grant because you know there was some thought that Grant may actually be nominated to run again in 1880, and it eventually turned out to be Garfield. But um, when the news broke that President Garfield had been shot, pres former President Grant came over to Franklin Cottage and spoke to Mrs. Garfield and expressed his, you know, his sympathies with her and and his hope, her his hope that 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 President Garfield would be okay, which obviously turned out not to be the case. But uh, a classy move by the former president, in my opinion. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much. A wonderful sure. presentation, Todd. Um, well, uh, those are our presentations for today. So we can open this up to questions if anyone has any. Please let us know. I don't know if you see any, Tara. No. Well, I have a quick question for John, actually. Um, John, I'm wondering, is the portrait of Anna Harris, is that officially considered a mourning portrait then since she's all in black? It's sort of a very austere background. Oh, John, I can't. Probably white. It's more than hung in Rouseland there in Vincennes, um, which, uh, you know, uh, they lived at uh, until the war of 1812. Um, but I honestly don't know if that's sort of official. It certainly looks like it uh, with, uh, with the drab background and everything like that. And uh, as I said, she certainly uh, was surrounded by death for uh, a great deal of her life. Thank you. Any other questions out there? Feel free. Feel free to just jump on and ask too, if you'd like.
Thank you for um, pronouncing Anna Harrison's maiden name. I always wondered if it was Sims or Symes, but it is Sims, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, the Sims family, uh, very famous in uh, New Jersey before uh, the American Revolution. And her father, of course, is very involved in uh, the legislature and the Continental Congress. Um, and uh, very prominent Ohioans, as I said, the, the Sims purchase uh, was kind of a controversial deal at the time. Uh, and uh, John Cleve Sims will buy hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres with continental uh, revolutionary money, which is a little bit, a little bit sketchy. But um, uh, they are a proud family uh, that go on, and the next generation down of Sims will be a uh, very uh celebrated individuals uh, as well and they have their own museum down in um uh, hamilton county uh if you ever get down that way well i have noticed there's a, a residence hall at miami university uh that's sims hall probably from the same family name absolutely thank you I think we have, uh, let's see, one question here. Uh, I'm just gonna go just a couple of minutes over since we had some technical difficulties so I can make sure I can answer everybody's question. Uh, let me see, where is it here? I believe it was, uh, is there, is Linda still on? Linda, did you have a question here? I see it in the chat, but maybe no longer. Okay. Uh, I see something also. Oh, I sorry. I see here, Linda. Uh, I live in Delaware, where the Hayes home was torn down and replaced by a gas station. Uh, yes, unfortunately, that is the case. Uh, uh, there is a interesting little comedy video that Mo Rocca did, kind of about this, uh, where he goes to the BP and he walks inside and sort of jokes about it. There is a, a plaque outside it, I believe, though, that talks about it. But yeah, unfortunately, it was torn down, and there's a gas station in place now, as sometimes happens. Let's see. Uh, we have a quick question from Christina uh, for John says, uh, why do you think the information about William Henry Harrison's death uh, was so incorrect for so long? I think that uh, when the doctor made the initial uh, diagnosis, uh, William Henry Harrison was old and his medical condition was pretty complicated. And that was um, one of the easiest things to say is that he died of pneumonia because it was present in the body. And then, you know, once a conclusion is made, a lot of people just accept it and, and move on. Uh, it wasn't until uh, a great deal of scientific work was actually done in, in um, the 2000s uh, that this was sort of reopened and reexamined. And then uh, one researcher follows another, and it just keep, keeps building. And there was a lot of press on it in uh, uh, 2014 uh, when these uh, findings came out. But uh, by that point, you know, a lot of people already know the story about uh, a long inaugural speech and no COVID hat, and it's a good admonishment for mothers uh, to tell their children to wear coats at the bus stop and stuff like that. So it just becomes part of American culture, and it's hard, it's really hard to break that, despite all the efforts by historians to put that uh, literature out there. Excellent. Thank you, John. Well, we're just a couple of minutes over here, so uh, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. Until next time, uh, I want to thank everybody so much for joining, all of our presenters today. Uh, very fascinating stuff. And Tara, thank you so much for helping facilitate. Uh, everyone, if you'd like to join on next time, we'll be here uh, March 14th, next Thursday, uh, between 6 and 7.15 again for the part two of our Ohio First Ladies. And uh, we're going to feature uh, Caroline Harrison, Ida McKinley, Helen Taft, and Florence Harding. Oh, thanks again, everybody. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Josh. Josh. Yes. Hello. Um, this is Linda in Delaware again. Um, I just wanted to ask a further question about uh, when when uh, visitors to the center ask you about his home. Is there uh, what kind of what kind of answer do you do you give them to? Uh, you know, tell them that it wasn't able to be saved or, you know, there was, I, 
I guess, a fundraising, but they never raised enough money to uh, save the Hayes home. You know, Linda, I'm not sure about all the details about that house in Delaware, about what, what the process was. Um, when we get questions about it at the house, we usually just say what I mentioned about it, that uh, unfortunately it's just no longer standing. And oh, okay. uh, sometimes we get into broader discussions about, you know, the need for historic preservation and how important it is to preserve historic structures. And, you know, standing in one while I'm giving the tour or we're giving the tour, it's really easy to exemplify the importance of that uh, uh, by what's around us. So. Uh, that's usually the extent of it that we go. I do usually mention the Moraka point too, because <laughs> it's. Uh... I think I did. I did see that uh, somewhere, maybe on YouTube or something. Ran across it. Okay. Well, I was just curious, and I don't remember what year it was torn down. I think it was the early 1900s, though. You know, maybe 40s, 50s. But yeah, I... it's a sad, sad day. Now you do know we have a statue, um, catty cornered from that. Uh, area. They put up a statue a few years ago. Yes, I have seen that. Yeah, it's a wonderful yeah. statue. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty cool. It okay, is. Well, yeah, thank you. This was uh, entertaining and uh, uh, educational, and I look forward to next Thursday. Okay, wonderful. We'll look forward to seeing you then. And All thank right. you again, everybody. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank you.